Hi booktube! My name is Sarah and welcome to The Bookish Knitter. Today I am coming to you with a weekly reads video. So, fun story! <laughs> um, it's been a busy week. It's been a busy week. I had a stellar reading week, but it's been busy. Um, been in the office and you know, I don't have a lot of time in the morning or a lot of time at night when I get home. And it's so dark now by the time I get home at night that to try and record anything, it's it's just way too difficult um, to get the right lighting. And not that I have to be perfectly like, oh my gosh, perfectly lit or anything like that. But I, I want you to be able to see me at least. <laughs> it's just too dark at night to do that without setting up like my ring light. And I don't like using those if I can avoid it. Um, it gets hot. <laughs> So essentially Thursday came around and I went, oh gosh, I haven't recorded anything for the vlog yet. And I think at that point I'd finished five books. So I'm like, well, at this point I might as well just do a weekly reads video. So that's why we're here. I'm here to do a weekly reads video. You guys know I switch back and forth between the weekly reads and the vlogs um, as it works for me essentially. So, you know, maybe vlogs might be a summertime thing when I have more light at night and I can sit down and talk to you guys. The other thing is, too, is that I don't want to rush through these reviews. I don't want to, you know, oh gosh, I've got to record something. I just finished a book. Let me sit down and do that. And I don't want to feel like I'm rushing through any reviews or anything like that because I love doing these reviews for you guys. Like, that's the biggest reason I am here on BookTube is to share the books with you that I am reading. And, you know, I don't want to diminish on that content. So weekly reads for the next, maybe for the next little while, maybe that'll change again. I don't know. I, got, I like to go back and forth. I have options. I do have options, but I know you guys love vlogs. I do have some plans for some vlogs in the future, so stay tuned. Um, but in this video, of course, I'm going to go through all the books that I read this week. I had eight books read this week, you guys. That's stellar. And I'm also going to talk about, of course, what I'm currently reading. And I'm also going to share a bit of a book haul with you guys. Now, First of all, before I get into everything, timestamps below. If you guys want to jump ahead to any of the reviews, go right ahead and check out the timestamps below. Um, the other thing is, too, is that I know I got no videos up for you guys last week, and I do apologize for that. It Again, it was a bit of a crazy week. Uh, last weekend was super lazy for me as well, so I didn't get anything filmed. Um, but I am going to be filming two more videos after I'm done filming this one. So that are going to go up next week. One, of course, is my September wrap up. And the other one is going to be another book haul, but it is my Harlequin digital book haul. So the books I'm going to show you now are not anything from that haul, essentially. These are kind of separate. I went to the thrift store and I have picked up a few books, other books digitally on audio and uh, ebook from Amazon. So Thought I'd share those with you too. So, <laughs> let's jump into all the books that I finished this week. So, first book that I finished this week uh, was The X Hex by Erin Sterling. I gave this book four and a half stars, you guys. I loved this so much. This is the first book in the X Hex series. Publication date September 2021. It literally came out like two weeks ago or something like that. This would be a, I consider this to be a contemporary romance slash paranormal romance a little bit. And I did listen to it on audio and it was narrated by Caitlin Davies. So this book was just so delightful. So this is the story of Vivian and Reese. So essentially the plot of this one is that Vivian and Reese dated for like three months back when she was, when they were teenagers. Um, the whole story takes place in this small town in Georgia, in the mountains in Georgia. And um, there's a college. It's like a college town. But it's really neat because half of the college is for, like, regular students. And the other half is for witches. So both Vivian and Reese are witches. Vivian didn't come into her abilities until she was older. Her mother was a witch. But she always, like, downplayed that part of herself. And then her parents passed away. So she was raised later on by her aunt and her cousin. Or her aunt mostly, but she was raised with her cousin, and both of them are practicing witches. So that's when she started to kind of come into her power a bit more. So her and Reese are dating in this, like, first year of college kind of an idea, whirlwind, whirlwind summer romance. And then he breaks, or then he tells her that he's got to go back home to Wales, which is where he's from, because his father is trying to find him a bride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm supposed to be bet betrothed, but we don't know who to who yet. So she's kind of like, dude. <laughs> so she's really upset. And like a 19-year-old upset, you know, witch, 
she curses him. Her and her cousin just have a little bit of fun. That first scene in the book is hilarious. They're use they're like, I don't know how legit this is going to be because they're using like a candle from Bath and Body Works <laughs> or something like that to curse him. So they put this curse on him and however five, ten years goes by, I can't remember what the time frame is, but he's now come back to town because it's the founding, fa it's the founding father's festival or something like that. And his family is the town's founders kind of an idea. So someone from the family needs to make an appearance at this thing every year. And it's pretty much for the whole month of October. So it does, of course, take place at Halloween, which is just utterly delightful. So Reese is the one who's sent back. And right from the minute he steps back into town, bad things start happening to him. Like the curse now comes into effect, essentially. Um, but there's more to the curse than just what Vivian and her cousin did. And it's, it's a really interesting plot line to find out what's going on with this curse and what's happening. So, of course, it's, the, it's a second chance romance between the two of them, which is what the heart of this book is, is a romance. But there's some great, um, this book was really funny, you guys. So there's this great scene where the things start going wrong in town. It's not just things that happen to Reese, but that's when they start to realize that there's more to this curse than just what Vivian did to Reese. Because things in town are starting to, to get messed up. And one of those things is that Sir Percival, which is Vivian's cousin's cat, starts talking. So this great scene, Vivian and her cousin are so excited the cat is talking. What's the cat going to say? He looks so intelligent. And the first words out of the cat's mouth are, treats? 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 <laughs> As a cat mom, that is so accurate. <laughs> My cats would give up state secrets for treats. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> So slowly throughout the book, he starts to learn new words, which is hilarious. But um, yeah, it's a great, great romance. Aaron Sterling is it? Yeah, Aaron Sterling is actually the pen name for Rachel Hawkins. So I think she, I know she's written a few thrillers and she's also written, I think, YA. So this one is an adult romance. It does get a little, a little spicy. There is some adult content in this book, but the majority of it is behind closed doors. For those of you who might shy away from that but don't let that stop you from reading it it happens more towards the end of the book um it's definitely scenes that you know once you know what's happening you could probably just skip through if you wanted to you're not gonna lose any major plot points in the book but yeah it was really really good i really enjoyed it four and a half stars definitely check this one out um the next book that i finished was alice's adventures in wonderland and through the looking glass by lewis carroll um, I read this for Victober. I gave both books together collectively a four-star review. Um, the publication date on, I know Through the Looking Glass was 1871, and I think Alice was uh, first published in Great Britain in 1865. Um, and Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, first published in Great Britain in 18... 72 1871 it says in brackets so i don't know so 1863 and 1871 so clearly perfect for victober so this is one of my favorite books however i haven't read it since i don't recall i don't have any recollection of ever reading it but just knowing that i really liked it i know my dad used to read these stories to me this was not the edition this is the 150th anniversary edition it's a penguin classic a deluxe edition that i have here and we had these old sets of books when I was a kid that were like these cloth bound like uh, editions and it was like Heidi, Robinson Crusoe, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for some reason. Uh, but all of these like kids books like classics were all in these beautiful um, cloth bound editions and dad used to read those to me. So I know he read these to me. And the reason I'm seeming to think that this is a favorite book of mine is because I love the movie, the Disney animated movie, not that train wreck that Tim Burton put out. I'm sorry. I got 20 minutes into that and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It was just too, for it was too weird for Alice in Wonderland. Let's put it that way, <laughs> which is saying a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone is probably familiar with this story. But what I didn't realize until I'd read this is how much the Alice in Wonderland movie from Disney um, takes not from Alice's adventures, but from Looking Glass. A lot of Looking Glass is what actually happens in the Wonderland movie, which I found very, very interesting. 
Um, so I'm glad I read both of them because a lot of the stuff that happens in Wonderland, I'm like, I don't work at, like, that didn't happen in the movie. That didn't happen in the movie, kind of an idea. So the animators at Disney, when they kind of put the script together, I'm assuming, for Wonderland, was they took from both books and they kind of pieced it together how it made sense to them. So, like I said, I think Looking Glass is actually the one I like more than Wonderland, mainly because there's more that I remember from Looking Glass. There's a poem in Looking Glass that I really loved, and I actually remember reading it as we had to memorize and read a poem at some point in public school. I don't remember what grade it was for, but the one that I did was The Walrus and the Carpenter, um, which is what appears in this book. I'm just trying to find it here. Okay, sometimes the, I love the deckled edges. Here it is, The Walrus and the Carpenter. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all its might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because, of course, it was the middle of the night. <laughs> so I think all of you have seen the Wonderland movie know that piece of animation, that part of the movie with the oysters, which always made me sad. <laughs> but yeah, at the end of the day, like I said, I gave this four stars. I really liked it. Um... The thing is, though, reading this, if I did not have the knowledge of the Wonderland movie, this would have confused the living daylights out of me because this is an acid trip for kids. Like, this is, <laughs> this is clearly, like, meant for, I mean, to be honest, there's no real plot in this story, in either of these stories. In the first book, Alice falls down the rabbit hole and then hijinks ensue. In the second book, she steps through a looking glass mirror and hijinks ensue. The second book is a little bit more plot driven in a way because she's almost trying to go through like this chessboard into different areas like and meets up with all these different characters. The Red Queen, the White Queen, um, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, Humpty Dumpty, like, you know, but as someone who loved the movie, this was so much fun to read and I... I don't, re I'm really, really happy I read it. And I was trying to finish this off and I think it was on Tuesday and I kind of had a really late day at work and I was really tired and I'm like, I just wanted to go home and read this, but I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to have the capacity, like I'm going to have the mental ability to sit and finish it off. Like I did not have very much left. I had like, you know, 30 or 40 pages left. So what I did was I went on my website's library, my library's website. <laughs> And I knew that there had to be an audio version of Looking Glass. And there was. So I'm like, perfect. So I downloaded it to my phone. And then as I was driving home from work, I listened to the tail end of it. Well, guys, I was just all kinds of happy because the narrator was Davina Porter, who's the narrator for Outlander, who is like my favorite narrator ever. <laughs> So that was an added delight for this, is to have her narrate the last little bit of Looking Glass for me. So yeah, at the end of the day, loved it. Glad I read it. Um, is it one that I would pick up again? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. Um, I might next time do the whole thing on audio, because that might be fun. But, um, but yeah, no, it was a great nostalgic trip for me. And yeah, I, I just, I, as I was reading it, part of it, I could you know, imagine my dad reading this to me as a kid. You know what I mean? So that was kind of really enjoyable as well. Um, so the next book that I finished for something completely different um, was Mexican Gothic by uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia. So yeah, this one, this was weird, you guys. It's really, that's really all I want to say about this book is this book was weird. <laughs> Excuse me, hold on. So I gave this book four stars. Publication date of June of 2020. This is a horror novel, and I can see how it is. I listened to this on audio, and it was narrated by Frankie Corzo. So essentially, this is the story of a woman who is living in Mexico City. It takes place in the 1950s, but in no way, other than the fact that a couple times in the book they mention the year, you would know this is in the 1950s. Um, but that doesn't really matter to the plot. So it's the 1950s. She's living in Mexico City. <clears throat> excuse me, she's from a very, very well-to-do family. Her father has a printing company of some kind. Her cousin, who they're very close, 
a few years ago married this this man. Now, she, our main character is Mexican, and her cousin, of course, is Mexican. And her cousin married this British man. Um, his whole family's from the UK, and they immigrated, I guess, over to Mexico and um, live in this very imposing house in a very, very small, small village in Mexico. And they had a silver mine that went belly up about 30 years ago. So 30 years prior to the start of the story. So the cousin marries this guy. Cousin, of course, comes from money as well. The family no longer has money because the silver mines are gone. And then the cousin sends, um, the cousin living in this, in this house sends the cousin in Mexico City this very, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time remembering their names, um, sends her this letter, like, that's very weird. It's just like, it's not her. It just clearly sounds like something's wrong. So the father sends the, the girl to Mexico or to this uh, village to go and find out what's up with her cousin. So I very much got Rebecca vibes from this at the very beginning because of Manderley. Like, if you've read Rebecca, you know. Th th that story focuses not just on Rebecca and, you know, Maxim de Winter and Mrs. Danvers, but just as much on the house of Manderley as well. And the house is a big proponent in this story. I don't want to give too much away because I didn't know much going into this book. And I think that kind of was a bonus in parts that I'd... Because I think, thinking back about it now, if I had known where this book was going to go, I don't know if I would have read it. But I did enjoy it, which is weird. I liked it, but on, on the other hand, I was like, I didn't like it. It's it's weird to say that. I think you guys know what I mean, but this is clearly not my normal cup of tea. But I still read it and enjoyed it. So she shows up at the house and all this weird stuff is happening. And I really don't want to say much more than that. There's clearly something up with the family. There is clearly something going on with the house. Um... And it's kind of one of those, there's even the cousin who's living there, she makes this comment about, once you come here, you can never leave. And all I, of course, got were vibes of Hotel California by the Eagles. <laughs> but again, I don't want to give too much away on this. What's happening with the family, like what the kind of thing is. Now, I figured it out. I kind of figured out part of it. So there's like two parts to like the whole reveal, if you will. And the first part of it, I had figured out because it's something that they keep mentioning over and over and over again in the book. And I'm like, it's got to have something to do with this. And I, of course, was right. But there's another part to it. Um, and I don't even want to get into that. It reminded me of an episode of The X-Files, to be completely honest, in the first season, where for anyone who's an X-Files fan, I am sporting my Mulder It's Me t-shirt today. Um... I've been all about the X-Files lately. I've been re-watching the series on Netflix. Or not on Netflix, on uh, Disney. Disney Plus. And um, <clears throat> anyway, I think it's in the first season where there's these um, Mennonite, kind of Mennonite type people who are like, they die and then they like, can like change their gender, change their body. That's all I'm going to say. But yeah, this book was creepy. There were scenes in this book that actually made me feel physically ill. Like, I had to stop listening to it and take a minute because I was literally feeling nauseated. So that's where the horror aspect of it comes in. It's not like a Saw movie where it's like blood, guts, and gore. It's very, very much that more psychological horror with um, some parts in it that were just icky, for lack of a better word. So yeah, so at the end of the day, I'm glad I read this one. Would I read it again? No. <laughs> if I had known going in what it was going to be about, would I have read it? Probably not. But I'm glad I didn't know. So I did read it, and it was entertaining, and that's all I have to say. Um, the next book that I finished was Death of a Wicked Witch by Lee Hollis. I gave this book four stars. This was a NetGalley read, so thank you very much to NetGalley and to Kensington for sending me an ER copy of this one to read and review. This is book 13 in the Haley Powell Food and Cocktails Mystery Series. Publication date, July of 2020, so it came out like over a year ago. My apologies. This is a cozy mystery, and of course I did listen to it on audio. And it was narrated by Randy Kay. This week is brought to you by audiobooks, you guys. Like, seriously. So it's been great. Um, this one was a lot of fun. This was a fun, cozy mystery. I do have a little kind of a tangent to talk about in terms of cozy mysteries. But I'll talk about that after I, I talk about the book. Um, because this book kind of really made that thought that I've had lately really kind of come to the forefront. So... This is the story, um, the Haley Powell series is about a woman named Haley 
and she writes this column for her local paper. This entire series takes place in Bar Harbor, Maine, which I think is a real town. Is that correct? I, I didn't, I meant to look that up and I didn't. And she writes this article where she tells a story, like does like an essay kind of an idea, and then has a food and cocktail pairing that goes with it. So this new couple moves to town, Tanya and Ted, and Ted is going to be taking over for the reverend who's going to be leaving town. He's retiring. And Tanya is running the new food truck in town called Wicked Witches. And it's apostrophe W-I-C-H-S, like sandwiches, very adorable. And she ends up being the one who gets murdered. So of course, then it's kind of trying to find out what happened. It takes place over Halloween, perfect fall vibes. I loved it. So I thought this was a great book. I really want to read more of this series. Um, but here's kind of my little cozy mystery tangent, if you will. So the murder itself doesn't take place till about 40% of the way through the book. And you really get to know Tanya. And I really liked her as a character. And even though I knew, because I read the back of the book, that she was going to be the victim, if you will, I was still really disappointed when she died because I liked her a lot. And it was, my thing is, this book really brought it to a forefront that earlier in the book, without giving too much away, earlier in the book, she's actually poisoned. Tanya's actually poisoned and ends up in hospital. And as I read that, this part of me thought to myself, I wish it would have stopped there. I wish that that would have been the mystery. Who tried to kill her? Not who killed her, but who tried to kill her? Because most of these cozy mysteries take place in these very small towns. And the per capita murder rate in these small towns is probably higher than Toronto or New York City or Las Vegas or... <laughs> I watch a lot of CSI and Law and Order. The murders there, are, they're plentiful, plentiful. But do you know what I mean? Like, it just seems really outlandish. And I know that they're a cozy mystery and you, I know you need to suspend your disbelief. However, I would like to see more cozies that don't necessarily deal with murder, perhaps. An attempted murder is just as bad, in my opinion. Or what about finding someone who went missing? Or I'm not talking ridiculous things like, you know, the local dog goes missing or something like that. But, you know, a little bit more high intensity. But does it always have to be a murder? That's my thing. And like I said, for this one, if they had stopped it at the attempted murder and then just kind of continued on the story from there... I think that that still would have been a very entertaining story and I would like to see more of that. So I don't know, for those of you who are cozy mysteries readers, what are, what are your thoughts? Like, are you all about like the murders or is it just the mystery aspect? Because I don't know, I've, I've, I've as you guys know, I'm attempting to like, I, I have so many story ideas that I want to write. I just have to actually, you know, write them. But one is to do a cozy mystery series. Oops, sorry. But one that actually doesn't have murder in it, but just like a cozy mystery series. And I just think that, I don't know. I, I just, I would like to see more of that. So anyway, that's my, that's my thoughts on that book. Um, excuse me. Sorry, guys. I've been talking a lot this morning. The next book I want to share with you is Stacy's Big Crush by N.M. Martin. I gave this book three and a half stars. It is Babysitter's Club book number 65. Publication date of June of 1993. This is, of course, a middle grade book. And guys, I listened to this one on audio, narrated by Aaron Moon. So <clears throat> I have been listening or reading the Baby Search Club books from my library. They have them all digitally. And the next group of books, like this one and the next whole bunch of them, there is crazy long wait, wait lists on them, like four, five, six weeks. And I really wanted to get to a couple of these in October. So I thought to myself, let's just bite the bullet and we'll buy them from Amazon. Just go ahead and buy them from Amazon. So I looked at them on Amazon and I think they're about five or six dollars, which is fine. You know, at first it was like, I can read these in an hour. Do I really want to spend five dollars on that? But then I'm like, I'd spend more going to the movies. You know, like I think about buying a hardcover book for thirty dollars that I can probably read in two or three days. Five bucks is a bargain. So then I noticed on there again I, I know I know that they're on audio but it didn't dawn on me and I'm like oh yeah how much are the audio versions so I went and looked and the audio versions are a couple bucks more than that so like if it's six dollars on Amazon it was eight dollars on audible and these are audible exclusives so you can't get them at your library on audio you can't get them on scribed or hoopla or anything at all like that you'd have to actually purchase them from audible and I refuse to use a credit for something that's only eight dollars because the credits cost me 14. So 
I went ahead and I picked this one up and the next book both on audio. Now what I really like what Audible did with these is that the first 10 or 12 books I think were all narrated by the same person which I think was Elle Flanning, Elle Fan, is that Dakota Fanning's sister? So it would be Elle Fanning. She narrated the first 10 or 12, but then after that, they have a different narrator for each babysitter. So for those of you who don't know how the Babysitter's Club books kind of work, is they're all told in first person. So for example, Stacy's Big Crush is told by Stacy. The next book in the series, Maid Marianne, is told by Marianne. So they had one narrator for each of the babysitters, and they narrate each of their own individual books, which I think is just absolutely delightful. And I love that they have done that. So anyway, um, uh, sorry, I just had a pop up on my phone. So they only put the original series on audio. So the first 126 books, the, the mysteries, the super specials, the super mysteries, the extra special books, none of those are available on audio. It's only the original series that are available on audio. So I decided to bite the bullet, and like I said, I bought this one, and I bought the next book, Made Marianne. And I might just continue to listen to the original series on audio because, as someone who has read and reread and reread this series several times, to listen to it now on audio was a completely different experience, and it was just adorable and charming. It's like three and a half hours long on audio. I went through it relatively quickly. I listened at about, all my audio is listened to at, at about one and a half times speed. And it was, I loved it. I, it was just an entirely new way to revisit this series that I love so, so much. So in this story, that, that was a whole other backstory about the audio. So in this story, Stacy develops a crush on her student teacher. And he is about 22 years old. She's only 13. It's adorable. Um, she writes him poetry. And <laughs> she fancies, she keeps telling her friends like, well, when he's this age, I'm going to be this age and it'll be just fine. And I'm like, no, honey, not at all. So it's, it's really, really cute. Um, and it was fun. Uh, <laughs> but I have to say that this cover is one of my favorites. A, the student teacher, Wesley, who's 22 years old in this scene in the book, they're at a middle school dance. He's in a tuxedo people, a tuxedo <laughs> as one does to go to a middle school dance. But my favorite thing in this entire cover is Jessie. <laughs> the way she's looking at Stacy is just, <laughs> we've all looked at one of our friends that way, right? When they, they're like, oh, you know, I like so-and-so, or I think I should do this. You kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like that kind of look. <laughs> and I absolutely love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So yeah, I really enjoyed this. It was super cute, super, super fun. Um, I love listening to it on audio and I'm looking forward to experiencing some more of these books on audio. And uh, Erin Moon was the perfect choice for Stacy in this book. Uh, the next book that I finished, we have three more, you guys, was Next Girl to Die by Dia Por uh, Por uh, po Poier, I believe is how you say her name. I gave this book three and a half stars. This is book number one in the Calderwood Files, publication date May 2019. This is a thriller mystery. And it was narrated on audio by Lauren Ezzo. So this was a Kindle Unlimited pick for the month. And I picked it up on audio for $1.99 because I downloaded the KU and then I just got the audio for cheap. And this is a mystery thriller. I don't want to give too much of it away. This was okay. To be completely honest, this was okay. I gave it three and a half stars. Um, Claire is our main character in the story. And she is a police detective and she was working out of Chicago. But she was born and raised in this small island community island community she was born born and raised in maine maine has a coast right vermont's the one that doesn't have the coast am i correct i'm sorry my u.s geography is horrific so i think it was a small island town off the coast of maine that sounds right saying that off the coast of maine just sounds right so anyway when she was younger uh, when she was a teenager her older sister was murdered and found dead in this park and they never found her killer. And then she went on to become a police officer and she was working in Chicago. And now she's been called back to town by the local chief of police because there's been another body discovered left in the same place in the same way as her sister. So that's pretty much what this story is about is they're trying to find out who this killer is. And while I like the story, I found Claire to be a very atypical, tough as nails detective. Like it seems to be, um, like 
kind of the go-to when it comes to female detectives. Like, they have to be really hard-edged because they can't, they have to be able to play with the big boys, essentially, in a way. And, yeah, I'm kind of overseeing that. Like, I would like to see a, you can be a good cop and still be sensitive and don't have to be very abrasive and very in people's, like, do you know what I mean? For that personality type, essentially. Um, the other thing that really kind of drew me out of this story was that this is also a part, partially a romantic suspense, if you will, because there is a relationship between Claire and this guy by the name of Noah, who is a, what does he do? He's a reporter. And of course they're at odds with each other. The cops and the reporters never get along and yada, yada, yada. But I was fine with the bit of like, they didn't like each other at first, then they had some flirting and that was okay. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you're getting this very graphic love scene. And I'm like, where, where is this coming from? Like, it just didn't seem like it fit. It's like the author just thought, I feel like writing a love scene. So I'm going to pin a love scene and I'm going to stick it in the middle of the book. And that's what she did. And it just was very jarring. Like, I have read mystery thrillers that have that kind of subplot to them. However, it's not graphic, whereas this was graphic. And I think that's what kind of threw me off. You know what I mean? And then, of course, after that, they can't get enough of each other. And it's constantly, you know, there's a, like, I'm pretty sure that there's a part of the book where they find a dead body. And then as they're leaving, she's thinking about jumping him again. And I'm like, D time and place, people. Time and place. <laughs> so did I love it? Not necessarily. It was entertaining. The mystery was good. That I did like in it. You know, it kind of kept me guessing. But overall, I don't know if I would continue on with this series. I think there is another book. Um, the next one that I read was Her Best Kept Royal Secret by Lynn Graham. I gave this book four stars. This is book number two in the Heirs for Royal Brothers series. This is a Harlequin Presents novel, number 3945, publication date of this month. It came out in October of 2021. Of course, it's a contemporary romance. And this was read to me on audio by Melanie Crawley. Guys, this was... This was if you are fans of the Presents novels, this was a Presents novel. <laughs> like, I don't know how else to describe this book other than the fact that it was the epitome of a Presents novel. And that is not a criticism. That is exact. I knew exactly what I was getting going into this one. So essentially, this one is about our main character's Gabby and his name is Angel. And they kind of had a relationship. Um, you know, they met up again. They, they used to go to college with each other. And then she was fancy on him, but he's a prince as, as these things go. And very, very much an alpha male as well. They have one night together years later. And then she of course ends up pregnant. It's like, essentially you're ticking all the boxes for a presents novel in this case. <laughs> alpha male, check. Uh, fake or not fake. Secret pregnancy, check. Foreign location, check. <laughs> And um, she, of course, goes to tell him and he's like all pissed off because, oh, do you know how many women have tried to to um, to trap him, um, you know, by claiming a fake pregnancy? And then, of course, he finds out, yes, the son is actually his. So the two of them have to get married and story goes from there. It was fun, you guys. This was really fun. I mean, on audio, it was six hours long. These are not terribly long books. They are a lot of fun. There's a lot packed into these very quick stories. Um, again, very, very alpha male. Um, I did like Gabby's character. The one thing I really like is that she kind of had a backbone and was like, dude, no, like, you know, and she like pretty much said to him, we don't have to get married. You know, that's not a thing. And he's like, if we don't get married, I'm going to take you to court. So like, what's a girl to do? He's a prince. You know what I mean? The courts are probably going to side with him regardless. So she's kind of trying to make the best of this situation. And of course, romance ensues and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I'm a fan of Lynn Graham. She does these beautifully and yeah, really, really fun. And the last book that I finished this week, you guys, I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. Pumpkin Patch Sweethearts by Sasha Summers. I gave this book four and a half stars. This is the second book in the Welsh Sisters series. Publication date, September of 2020. This is a contemporary romance. And oh my gosh, you guys, if you want a fall book without it being Halloween spooky, please go and pick this one up. If you love Hallmark movies, please go and pick this one up. You will love it. This is the epitome of a Hallmark movie in book form. So it's about our main characters, Harley and Josh. 
and she is living in this small town and he has just moved to town. He's a single father. He's a widower. He has a son and a young daughter and the daughter is very shy, um, very standoffish. She doesn't like crowds. There's reasons for that that are divulged as you read the book. Um, the meet cute at the beginning is they, Josh and Harley, who had never met before, literally bang into each other at the local coffee shop and she spills pumpkin spice lattes all over him. Like, can you get a better meet cute for a autumn novel? It was perfect. So uh, Harley is Nadia, the, the little girl's teacher, and her and Josh are kind of put together a lot of the time because they're helping Nadia and there, there are fall fairs, there is pumpkin carving, there is uh, fall baking, there is bobbing for apples. There, this book is fall. Like, if you needed fall, it exploded within the pages of this book. But not in a overbearing kind of sickly sweet way. There's kind of a lot going on also in this book that, is, that, are, that are slightly more difficult topics. The death of, of course, his wife and things like that. So it balances each other so, so well. This is a clean romance. There is no adult content in this at all. This is the second in the series, but it's the first one that I've read. The first book, Dog Park Sweethearts, I think it's called, it takes place at, at uh, Valentine's Day. So I'm going to read that one in February. So I am reading them backwards. And you do see Autumn and Noah, who are the couple from the first book. Autumn is Harley's sister. But you're not given away to a lot of their romance. And I mean, the thing is, like I always say with contemporary romances, you know how the story ends. It's the journey. So yes, I know that Autumn and Noah end up together in the first book, but I want to read their journey. Do you know what I mean? So I will go back and read that one uh, eventually, but yeah. Loved it so, so much. Please, please check this one out if you haven't checked it out yet. Sasha Summers is a fantastic writer. I love her book so much. So, <laughs> bit of a longer video. That's what happens when you read eight books in a week. <laughs> I'm super happy with that, you guys. Super happy. And I know I did a whole video a couple weeks ago about enjoying my reading and slowing it down and, you know, maybe not listening to as much audio, but audio has worked for me right now. And if it works, go with it. That's pretty much what I'm saying at the end of the day. And like I said, I listen to all my audio at one and a half times speed. So I'm not flying through these things at three or four times speed. I am thoroughly enjoying them. I'm taking my time with them. You know, it just so happens that, you know, in the morning or at night when I'm just I'm too tired to do anything else. I will just sit and pop in an audiobook and let the story be told to me and do some knitting or some cross stitch. And it's, it's been fantastic. So what am I currently reading? So today I plan on starting. I haven't started it yet. I'm going, I'm going to have another babysitter's club book cause it's Sunday and I'm in the mood and it's Christy and the haunted mansion by Anna Martin. This is the ninth book in the babysitter's club mystery series. So that's exciting. Uh, don't have any idea what it's about. I think it's something about Christy is taking her little softball team like to a meet or to a game and the car breaks down. They have to spend the night in this creepy haunted mansion. Sounds delightful. Um, the other book that I'm currently about half, not quite halfway through. I've been reading this one since the first of the month. I need to get back on it because I haven't picked it up in a few days. Is Missing at Christmas by Katie Richards. This is the second book in the West Investigation series. This is about a woman whose sister goes missing and she is trying to find out what happened. It's a second chance romance because the private investigator who's helping her is a guy that she kind of had a one night stand with um, months back and it takes place at Christmas time. So I'm liking this one. And then another one that I'm hoping to start today, this is an audiobook, is 15 Minutes of Flame. I love punny, cozy mystery titles. 15 Minutes of Flame by Christian Brecher. And this is the third book in the Nantucket Candlemaker Mystery Series. I think it's the third and final book. It came out last year. And I haven't seen any new ones on the horizon, so I can't confirm that. But um, it looks cute. It, it takes place in the fall. This is part of my, like, cozy Halloween read-through of all these cozy mysteries, Halloween-themed. I think I'm going to do this as well again in December, you guys, and read like holiday theme cozies. Like, I think that's going to be so much fun. So anyway, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting this one started. Now on to my book haul. So I'll do the physical book haul first, and then I'll share with you guys the few um, digital books that I've picked up. So yesterday, my husband and I, as adults do, there was a new um, dollar store that opened. So Garrett and I had to go and check that out. And guys, they had an amazing selection of books. They weren't cheap cheap like I think they were like three dollars or 350 per book and they had a ton of cozies and I 
almost bought a bunch of them, but I kept thinking like, I can get this from my library. I can get this from my library. And while I can probably pick this one up from my library as well, it's a Heather Graham and it was in mint condition. And you guys know I'm a huge, huge fan of Heather Graham. So this is Tomorrow the Glory. Um, it just says it's a Graham novel. So this is one of her historicals. And yeah, the woman, she is Kendall Moore, a spirited Southern belle as proud and as beautiful, beautiful, driven by a cruel marriage bed betrayal to risk her life in a dangerous gamble for freedom. The man, he is Brett McLean, a Confederate agent who meets Kendall abroad, the warship Jenny Lynn, and loses his heart in a single soaring night of passion. The glory, but war and treachery soon tear them apart. Brent into raging battle, Kendall into uh, into desperate flight from a scorned husband's white hot revenge. They live only for the promise of tomorrow and a love that will burn forever in both their hearts. So yeah, clearly I think it's a uh, I almost said a World War Two. That is not World War Two. Um, uh, Civil War. So she does a lot of these Civil War books. So I'm looking forward to this. I think this, I'm almost guaranteed this is a reprint. Um, copyright 1985 by Heather Graham, previously published under the name Shannon Drake. So yeah, this is an older one. I don't know when it was originally published, though it doesn't say. But yeah, this is a reprint. So yeah, I'm glad I picked that up. And then um, I got a couple of books through Thrift Books, um, just because I wanted to pick them up. And I grabbed this one. There was this series, I remember reading some of these when I was little not little, when I was like middle school into a teenager, my local library had all of them. And I remember reading a bunch of them. And I went on and I bought the first one. And these are, it's almost like a category, I guess you call it. They're Sunfire. And every single book had a, a, a female's name. So there's a list of them here in the back. So like this one's Amanda. This is the very first one. Um, Susanna, Elizabeth, Danielle, Joanne, Jessica, Caroline, blah, 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 blah. And they're all like historical romances, but they're teenage, not, you know, like young adult. So this one says, with only a silk dress to protect her from the blazing frontier sun, Amanda fears she will die on the Oregon Trail. As the memories of Boston, the nightly balls, and Joseph fade, the hardships of life on the wagon trail fill her days. Changing from a spoiled city girl to a strong young woman, Amanda finds drought and death, beauty and joy, and a love that will last forever. So like... I want to collect all of them, but I went ahead and got the first one. I was able to find it relatively cheaply on, um, on thrift books. So I went ahead and picked that one up. So I'm glad I have it now in my, um, collection. When did this come out? When? 1984, guys. I was three <laughs> when this came out. So that's pretty awesome. And then the other one, this is a series I've seen a lot of places. You cannot get these on ebook or else I would. Um, and I've never actually seen them in physical edition before. And I picked this one up because I thought it would be a lot of fun to read at Christmas time. And this is part of the Love Find You series. And this is a inspirational romance. Um, Summerside is the publisher. So they're all called Love Find You. And then it's in a different location. So this one is in North Pole, Alaska. So yeah, a former Marine is no match for, a, for, for the spunky Sam Sinclair. Um, he's a self-admitted Scrooge. I love it. So yeah, this is, and I just love the size of this. Like it's not in the best of condition, but this one just looks like it was so much fun. So yeah, I think this one's going to be a delight. And like I said, these are, um, uh, inspirational romances. So they are faith-based. So we have like, okay, so here's more of them. Want to peek into local American life past and present? The Love Finds You series published by Summerside Press features real towns that combine travel, romance, and faith in one irresistible package. So they have like Miracle, Kentucky, Snowball, Arkansas, Romeo, Colorado, Valentine, Nebraska, blah, blah, blah. So I'd like to pick up more of these. If any of you are familiar on where I can get more of these, let me know. Because like I said, they're not available digitally. So I'm going to have to find them used secondhand. So... Yeah, glad I got those. And then I went to my local thrift store and I grabbed five books. I actually, re re uh, six books. I restrained myself. So they had, first of all, I found an old Harlequin romance. This is Cap Flamingo by Violet Winspear. Number 884. I'm pretty sure this is a reprint. I'm almost certain this is a reprint of the original. So the original was published in 1965. And this edition was published in 81. 
Yeah, copyright 1964 by Violet Winspear. But yeah, but the red pages. I just saw this and I'm like, okay. This is what I kind of tend to look for now at the thrift stores are like these really old ones to add to my collection. So even though this is a reprint of the original number 884, I'll still just put it in with my collection as that one. And if I ever came across a copy of the original publication, I would probably switch them out. But yeah, I'm happy to have this. And then I found these ones, which are actually Mills and Boone. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that, um, just to add these to my collection. So I'm sure these were probably reprinted at some point into Harlequin romances, but these are Mills and Boone. So we have Autumn Concerto by Rebecca Stratton. St yes, Rebecca Stratton. There's that one. I grabbed all of these that I saw on the shelf. There was only like the f four or five of them. So this one was published in 1974. This is from 75. So that's pretty cool. And then I got Lord of the Island by Mary Wiberly. Clearly the 1970s. Let's look at her outfit and his outfit there. Let's see how right I am. 1978. Yep. <laughs> and then, oh, this one. September in Paris. Look at the cover, you guys. Andrea Blake. It's got to be the 70s as well. Pretty sure all of these are the 1970s. Ooh. Okay, this edition was 74, but this was originally published in 61. So this might be one of my oldest ones, like in terms of publication date. That's pretty cool. And then this one, like, wow. The Man Outside by Jane Donnelly. Look at that, you guys. That's my grandmother right there. Like, I... <laughs> She was that, that we would go out and if it was raining, that woman never carried an umbrella. She had one of those, like, do you know what I'm talking about? Like the rain? Yeah. That's my grandmother right there. <laughs> this was originally published in 1974. So yeah. So those are exciting. So those are all the physical books that I have to show you guys. So let's get into the um, digital. So I grabbed two books on audio. One is a new release and the other one is a pre-order that's coming out in, in November. So the audio, gosh, this is a long video. Sorry, you guys. So the first one, um, the vlogs are usually long anyway. So does it really matter? No. Um, so the first one that I got is a new release and it's called, I love the title, A Holly Jolly Diwali by Sonia, uh, by Sonia Lally. Um, she is actually a Canadian author. Um, I've read one of her books before. The Matchmakers List, I think it was. It takes place in Toronto. She's from Toronto. This one says, One type A data analyst discovers her free-spirited side on an impulsive journey from bustling Mumbai to the gorgeous beaches of Goa and finds love waiting for her on Christmas morning. Does that not sound delightful? And I love the cover. It, I used a credit on audio to pick this up because it just sounded so charming. And then the one that I pre-ordered also using a credit um, comes out on November 2nd. And when I saw this book was coming out, I got super excited. So fellow Canadians, you probably know who this guy is. Rick Mercer. This is called Talking to Canadians, again by Rick Mercer. He is a comedian here in Canada. Um, a political, I want to say political com comedian in a way. Very much satire. Um, he was on, he got his start... He got his start on a TV show called This Hour Has 22 Minutes, which is like kind of, it's like a week in news, but spoof, kind of like not spoof, but again, satire, right? And then he did this whole thing, and you can YouTube it because it's hilarious, called Talking to Americans, where he goes to the US. And I mean, he's not making fun of Americans. He's kind of making fun more of the fact that Americans tend to not know too much about what happens outside of America. <laughs> so he's interviewing these people at different locations like Mount Rushmore and in front of the Capitol building or, you know, um, in Washington and stuff like that and asking them Canada related questions that are BS, like they're not real things that happen and just trying to see what they say about it essentially, right? So it, it's funny. It's funny. But then he ended up having his own TV show called The Mercer Report. And my father and I loved watching that like all the time. And he go, it was a half an hour TV show and he would do like a little bit of like new satire stuff. And then he would go to all these different places in Canada and guys, YouTube it because some of the places he went, um, one of my favorite episodes that still makes me laugh to this day. And if I'm really having a bad day, 
I will watch this 10 minute long bit. I will link it below for you guys if you want to go ahead and check it out. So musician Jan Arden, who is of course also Canadian, uh, they're very good friends, the two of them. And he takes her up the CN Tower to the Skywalk because there's a part now on the CN Tower that you can walk outside of the CN Tower, like walk around it. You're completely strapped in. But she is petrified and he is not. And he's legit trying to do an actual interview with her and she's just losing her mind. <laughs> but it's so funny. He's met with um, all kinds of different politicians. He spent time at, um, you know, with different uh, Canadian prime ministers in their homes. He went bungee jumping with a prime minister. Like, <laughs> he's he's gone up to, um, oh God, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? White, um... Is it Whitehorse? And he went on the polar bear expedition. Like, legit, this guy has done a ton of stuff. So this is kind of his memoir, and I am so stoked about it. And the reason I had to get it on audio is because he narrates it. And he is from Newfoundland, and if you hear him talk, he's from Newfoundland. <laughs> Especially if you if there, there's been episodes where he was back in back home in Newfoundland, and you can really hear the accent. So it's, I'm so, so excited for this one. This is one that's going to get read for nonfiction November, and I cannot wait. And the other two books, very quickly, the last two. The first one, I saw this one come up on uh, Instagram, and the cover just drew me in. It's a YA, and it's called The Holiday Switch by Tiff Marcello. And it says, a bookish Filipino-American girl who crosses paths with the, in with the innkeeper's aggravating nephew. But when they accidentally switch phones, their newly discovered secrets draw them together. Yes, please. I just thought this was so cute. It's going to get read in December. I can't wait. And then we have Her First Christmas Cowboy by Maisie Yates. This is book 0 0.5 in the Four Corners Ranch series. It's a Maisie Yates novel. It's a novella. I think it's like 55 pages long. It's the start of a new series by her. I'm sold. I picked it up as soon as I saw it. So yeah. Okay, guys, that's it. That's it. This has been a really, really long video and I do apologize, but typically the vlogs are long too. So whatever. Um, but I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I kind of had a lot to talk about. I finished a lot of books this week. So yeah, let me know. Have you read any of the books that I talked about? What did you think about them? And what did you read this week that you really enjoyed? And until my next video, everybody take care and happy reading. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye. Thank you.